Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. It's so good to see you. Sorry, I'm a little late tonight getting started. I was asked to babysit my grandkids today, and I never say no to that. So I'm glad to see you. I think you're going to like the video we do today, IVs, blood, and some other meds. But it's got some good, uh, some really good questions to go over. First, I need to say thank you to our channel members. You are the best. We have over 200 channel members now, y'all. That's so awesome. And I get lots and lots of messages from our uh, members and subscribers telling us that we've been helping them pass and collect. So I'm really, really glad about that. Let me know if, uh, if we were able to help you pass. I'm really excited to hear that. Uh, if you want to pay me for something, you can go to clinicreviews.com. It's right there along the bottom, the ticker. People don't like seeing the ticker, so I'm going to take it off. But that's where you go to sign up. If you want to do next-gen tutoring with me for a cost, you can also sign up for small group tutoring with Mark Clinic himself. And you can sign up to get the online on-demand clinic review, which is uh, the way you study for NCLEX, y'all. There's nothing like it. It's awesome. It's amazing. You can also sign up to do a live in-person review. Mark does live three-day live in-person reviews in Ohio, and I do them in California. Um, if you decide to go to a live in-person review, three-day live in-person review, which Mark really thinks is the best, and I have to say I agree with him because you get that really great interaction with us, with other people. But if you do go to a live in-person review, you can get the online on-demand in addition for 75% off. Okay, 75% off the online on-demand cost if you go to a live in-person review. Okay, so let's not uh, let's not waste any more time. Let's go right to our questions. They are good ones. Okay, Rho D immune globulin is prescribed for a client before they are discharged after a spontaneous A. A spontaneous A is a miscarriage, so don't let that throw you off. The nurse instructs the client that this drug is used to prevent which condition? Development of a future RH positive fetus, an antibody response to RH negative blood, a future pregnancy resulting in A, or development of RH positive antibodies. Okay, so I always try to help you understand that you do not have to know everything to get answers correct, and you do not have to memorize Rho D immune globulin. Please don't memorize that. You don't have to. Um, all you need to know is that blood type, if someone is a negative blood type, means they don't have anything in their blood that can cause an allergic reaction with some other blood type. Now, A still has to go with A, and B has to go with B, and O is the universal donor. But the negative and positive, the negatives don't have anything extra that it can't cause any kind of reaction. Positives, like A positive, they have an additional things going on in their blood that can cause an allergic reaction. So if a mom is a negative A, and baby is a positive A, or mom is a negative B, and baby's a positive B, mom can develop antibodies against that positive blood. And we always give a medication if mom has a positive baby, A positive, B positive, whatever, and mom's a negative, we always give a medication so mom doesn't develop antibodies against that positive blood type in case she gets pregnant again. It doesn't matter if she has a spontaneous A miscarriage, it doesn't matter if she delivered, as long as that was she was exposed to that, she could develop antibodies against that. So A, we can't even we can't we can't protect against that. The baby's going to be what they're going to be, right? Development of a future Rh positive fetus. Well, that that that's ridiculous. We can't stop that. So A is out. An antibody response to Rh negative blood. There is no such thing. There's no such thing as an antibody response to Rh negative blood. Only antibody response to positive. Remember, negatives don't have anything in there for an antibody to react to. See a future pregnancy resulting in A. Well, we can't predict that. Y'all, we can't do anything to predict that. Uh, and D, development of RH positive antibodies. So that's the correct answer. Again, you don't have to memorize every single fact to get this right. You only have to understand the concept of positive and negative blood types. Two, the primary healthcare provider prescribes IV mag sulfate for a prima gravid client at 38 weeks gestation diagnosed with severe preeclampsia, which medication would be most important for the nurse to have readily available? Diazepam, hydralazine, calcium gluconate, or phenytoin. All right, so we have 38 weeks gestation, which she is full term. You're full term at 37 weeks. However, she is severe preeclampsia and severe preeclampsia can result in seizures. 
And we know that when magnesium levels go up, the risk for seizure goes down. Okay. So we want to increase mag level, but if the mag level gets too high, that can cause some other problems. So we need to have available to us the antidote for mag sulfate. Calcium gluconate is the antidote for mag sulfate. I, like I said, I don't expect you to know everything, but there are some facts you do have to know. Okay, and this, this is one I think it's worth it for you to know. So I, I just wanted to make sure you knew this fact, calcium gluconate is the antidote for mag sulfate because it is, it is a good chance you could get a mag sulfate question on the NCLEX related to preeclampsia or preterm labor. We use mag sulfate to prevent preeclampsia or prevent the complications of preeclampsia and to, to stop preterm labor. And so you need to just know a little bit about that in case you get it. Phenytoin prevents seizure, but y'all, we don't give phenytoin to pregnant women. No, absolutely not. It's like one of those bad drugs, right? You can't give that. Hydralazine, perhaps we could give to pregnant women, but it's not going to prevent seizures. It's not going to do anything for mag sulfate. And diazepam uh, is, is used to reverse a seizure that's already started, but we're wanting to prevent a seizure. Diazepam doesn't prevent a seizure and it's used for anxiety. So, uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna pick that one. All right. Question three, the primary healthcare provider prescribes whole blood replacement for a multigravity client with abrupt placenta. What should the nurse do first before administering the IV blood product, validate client information and the blood product with another nurse check the vital signs over transfusing before transfusing over five to six hours, ask the client if they have ever had any allergies or administer hundred mils of 5% dextrose solution intravenously. All right. This is not a maternity question. Y'all, this is a blood transfusion question. So don't be freaking out and say, I don't know maternity. You don't have to know anything about maternity to answer this question. So what do we know about blood transfusions? First of all, let's just see what we know already. Well, we know that um, it has to be validated with another nurse, right? Two nurses have to check everything, okay? So we know that. We know it always goes in with normal saline. That's the only IV solution that can go in with blood is normal saline. We know it has to run over no more than four hours. And we gotta get frequent vital signs, especially at the beginning. To, to make sure they don't have an allergic reaction. So that's some stuff I know. So let's see what the answers are. Validate client information and, and, with, and the blood product with another nurse. So I like that. I absolutely have to do that. B, check the vital signs. Yes, before transfusing over five to six hours. No, four hours maximum, y'all. So remember, the answer has to be all right or it's not right. So both halves of that have to be right or the answer's not right. So I'm crossing off B. Ask the client if they have ever had any allergies. Well, okay, I like that one. D, administer 100 mils of 5% dextrose solution. Absolutely not. Normal saline is the only one. So I crossed off B and D. All right, I do want to ask them if they have any allergies. What? Let's see, this is a first question. What should the nurse do first before administering the IV blood product? So I know I need to do A and C. Um. This is a time where you go, well, I got to do A and C. And like, how am I supposed to pick one first? Like nobody taught me which one to do first. You got to do them both. Okay. So when you get a question like this, where you have more than one right answer, see if one of them is the umbrella answer. I've taught this before. Y'all, this works like five out of every hundred questions. This probably works for me at least five times out of a hundred questions, which I think is a lot. All right. So is there an umbrella answer? So if I'm validating client information, that would include their allergies and blood product with another nurse. So with another nurse, I'm going to check their allergies. I'm going to check the blood product. I'm going to do all right, all the, the numbers, make sure everything's right. So A is the umbrella answer that encompasses C. So A is the right answer. Okay. So if you get a question like this, where you're like, man, two, two answers are both right. How am I supposed to know which one to do first? Check and see if there's not an umbrella answer there. That works for me a lot of times. All right, four, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the first choice in treating a child with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Which adverse effects should the nurse include in the teaching plan for the parents? Select all that apply. This has nothing to do with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Okay, so don't be going, I don't know anything about that. You don't have to. It's about non-steroidals. 
weight gain, abdominal pain, blood in the stool, folic acid deficiency, or reduced blood clotting ability. All right, non-steroidals. What would I teach the parents? Well, first of all, I'm talking about adverse effects. If you don't know the difference between adverse effects and side effects, go back and watch my fundamentals of med administration and it talks about it in there. But adverse effects are things that we stop the medication for. We, we stop taking the med if there are adverse effects, as opposed to side effects, we just manage. So adverse effects are things we would stop the med for. So even if I knew nothing about non-steroidals, I would not pick A because we don't stop meds because they cause weight gain. Lots of meds cause weight gain and we don't stop meds for that. So that's not an adverse effect. So I'm crossing off A just to begin with. Now, if you were to ask me, what do you know are some adverse effects of non-steroidals? I would say, well, stomach ulcers, gastric bleeding can cause a lot of irritation to the stomach can cause ulcers. So I know that there's always, whenever I get a SATA question related to meds, there's always one thing that I know. So if there's one thing I know for sure, I go, well, if they could get gastric ulcers that cause bleeding, they could definitely have blood in the stool, right? That's C because I know that can go through and, and can come out the other end. And so blood in the stool. Yeah, sure. So, and that's definitely an adverse effect. I mean, we would stop the, the med if they're having blood in their stool. So what I do, if I know one is right, I look to see, now this was SATA questions. I look to see if there are any other answers that go along with that, right? So if they're going to have a gastric ulcer, well, they could certainly have abdominal pain. So B and C, I like, those kind of go together. Folic acid deficiency it doesn't go along with blood in the stool. I don't know if folic acid deficiency is a problem. I'm not going to pick it. Reduced blood clotting ability. All right, I've never told anybody that reduced blood clotting ability is, a, is an adverse effect of non -steroidals. However, it goes along with blood in the stool. It matches that. And so if I'm going to answer, if I'm going to use testing strategies, because I know I don't know everything, and I know I don't have to know everything. But if I'm going to use a good testing strategy, knowing that I don't know everything, E goes along with B and C. And so I'm going to go ahead and pick E, even though I'm not sure, but it sounds like it goes along with the others. And in fact, E is the correct answer. Now, this is a strategy you do have to practice a little bit. Okay, I've, I've practiced it before and I don't always get them 100% right when I use this, but I get them right, y'all, more often than I would otherwise. And I know it's impossible to memorize every fact about every med. I, I can't. I can't memorize every side effect and adverse effect. So I have to have some testing strategies to help me get these questions correct, or at least mostly correct. And the good news is uh, NCLEX is giving partial credit now on SATA questions. All right. Five. At 0900, the nurse started an infusion of one liter of 5% dextrose and normal saline, D5 normal saline, infusing at KVO rate. Now, I didn't write this out. KVO means keep vein open. Keep vein open. I didn't write it out. Keep vein open is uh, a term that we use clinically, and you should know what it means. And it means just run the, run the IV infusion in at a very low rate. We're just keeping the vein open. So that's usually around 20 mils an hour. So if they tell you it's running at keep vein open, you should say to yourself, it's running at about 20 mils an hour, maybe 15, maybe 25, but no more than 25. At 0945, the client reports a pounding headache, is dyspneic, and experiencing chills, and has a heart rate of 116. The nurse notes that the IV bag has 400 mils remaining. The nurse should take which action first? Slow the IV infusion, assess the client's blood pressure, remove the IV catheter, or call the healthcare provider. Now, this is a truly, truly clinical reasoning question. This is a high-level question, y'all. If you can get a question like this right on NCLEX, you're doing very well because this is a high level. There's no memorization involved in this at all. It's pure clinical reasoning. So what you have to do is you say, well, I started this one liter, a thousand mil bag at nine. It was supposed to run in about 20 mils an hour. So if it's running in at a 20 mils an hour, I mean, I would expect it to take like a long time to run in. Like I'd probably have to change the bag before it even finished running. Okay. So just because it would probably expire. And, and when I go check it at 945, there's only 400 mils remaining, which means between nine and 945, that's 45 minutes. They've gotten 600 mils and they were supposed to get 20 mils an hour. 
So I go, well, that's not good. Now, the what they're experiencing, it's serious, but it's sort of vague. Like, it's not completely clear to me what's going on. A pounding headache, dyspneic. Okay, I'm concerned about that. Do they have fluid in their lungs because they got that so fast? Chills. I don't know why they have chills. A heart rate of 116. I'm not really sure why they have a heart rate of 116. I mean, it's all bad stuff. This is bad stuff. But I, I, I know it's probably some fluid volume overload issue, but there may be more than this. So the, the nurse should take which action first. So it's a first question. So slow the IV infusion. Well, it's run in really fast. So I definitely need to slow the IV infusion. I'm keeping that on the list. Assess the client's blood pressure. I would like to do that, um, but I'm not sure I would do that first. So I'm going to put a question mark next to that. Remove the IV catheter. Okay, I know I don't need to do that. Call the healthcare provider. Okay. I would definitely like to call the healthcare provider about this. However, it's a first question. First question, what would I do first? Now, considering the fact that they just got 600 mils in 45 minutes, it's obviously running way too fast. So do I want to slow the IV infusion first or call the healthcare provider first? Well, considering that it's running that fast, I would rather slow the IV infusion first. Y'all, if that answer wasn't there, I would call the healthcare provider because this patient is serious enough condition that I would call the healthcare provider first, like calling a rapid response, sort of like that. But this, but because it has the option to slow the IV infusion, I'm going to do that first. So this is a really good example where the right answer is the right answer because of the other answers. If you don't understand why we slow the IV infusion first, you need to think about it. Okay, don't go ask somebody else, why would we do that first? You have to think about it. You have to think about clinical reasoning and safe nursing practice. And we know we need to call the healthcare provider first, but they just got 600 mils in 45 minutes. And I'm not going to call the healthcare provider while that's still running in. I'm not going to do that, y'all. I'm not going to do it. So the correct answer is A. And if you struggled with this one, you need to continue to practice your NCLEX questions and, see, and, and think about clinical reasoning, clinical reasoning. This is not a, I just memorized the right answer to this. Do not memorize that as the right answer. This is a clinical reasoning question. And by the way, if you're getting clinical reasoning questions right on NCLEX, you're definitely going to pass because they're the highest level that you can get. All right, six, upon entering the room, a nurse notes that there is a cap missing on the central venous access device. The client is experiencing shortness of breath, coughing, and chest pain. What would the nurse do first after replacing the cap on the open port? Reassure the client that the symptoms will resolve very quickly. Place the client in low follower position to facilitate easier breathing. Obtain an ECG to rule out possible MI or notify the health care provider of the incident. Y'all, this is another clinical reasoning question. There's no, do not memorize the right answer here. This is pure clinical reasoning. And again, if you get this question right, you're guaranteed to pass NCLEX because if you can clinical reason here, um, you're doing good. So, well, you have to get fundamentals. You're not going to get to these questions until you get the fundamental questions correct. That's why you need to watch fundament, watch the fundamentals videos. Okay. But if you get the fundamentals right, then you're going to get to these questions and you do need to pass some of these. All right. So a CV, central venous axis, that's a central line. And the reason we keep caps on there is so that air doesn't go in the line, right? And they just came in and there's the cap is off. And now she's, the patient is short of breath, coughing and chest pain. I'm like, oh man, that's not good. So they put the cap on. And then what do you do next? Okay, because definitely put the cap on, right? It's sort of like slowing the IV rate down, put the cap on. Stop the cause of the problem, right? You slow the IV rate down because that's what was causing the problem. Here, the cap off is causing the problem. So we got to take care of that first. Then what do you do? Okay. So what do you do next? Reassure the client that the symptoms resolve very quickly. Well, absolutely not. They could have gotten an air embolism, which could have gone to their lung and they got a pulmonary embolism now, right? So absolutely not. A is out. Place the client in low flower, low fowler position to facilitate easier breathing. Well, I've never placed somebody in low fowler position to facilitate easier breathing. I place them in high fowler position to facilitate easier breathing, but I've never put them in low fowler position. So unless nothing else makes any sense, I'm going to cross off B. I'll come back to it if none of the other answers make any sense. Obtain an ECG to rule out possible MI. Well, I like that. I mean, they've got chest pain. 
notify the healthcare provider of the incident. Okay. I like that. So I like C and D. And there's no umbrella answer here, right? So I got to do one or the other first. So what do I think is going on? I think they probably got an air embolism and they now have a pulmonary embolism. Do I think they're having an MI? There's no reason to think they're having an MI. I mean, not based on what they told me. And remember, you only know what they t tell you. If they told me they had a history of heart disease or, uh, you know, they have a history of unstable angina. Like I would, that would be a completely different scenario, but they didn't tell me that. They told me they left the port off the central line. So I am not going to take time to get an ECG to rule out MI. There's no reason to think they're having an MI. They're short of breath. They're coughing, chest pain. That's PE. So I'm going to notify the healthcare provider. Now, remember the last one, we didn't pick notify the healthcare provider first. We picked decrease the IV rate. But here they told us they I already put the cap on it. So now I've got an unstable patient. I think they could be having a pulmonary embolism. I'm going to call the doc and see what they want me to do. Now you might go, well, don't, shouldn't you put oxygen on them? Shouldn't you put the head of the bed up and all that stuff? Yes, absolutely. But none of those options are there, y'all. Remember the right answer is the right answer because of the other answers, especially in clinical reasoning questions. In clinical reasoning questions, the right answer is the right answer because of the other answers, y'all. Okay, so you've got to keep that in mind as you're taking these kinds of questions. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. Those were not particularly easy questions. Those were higher level questions. And if you found you got them correct. Congratulations to you. And if you struggled with them, then just keep studying. You'll get there. Keep working with me. Keep going through some of my videos and you'll be good to go. All right. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.